G'day Legends, Blake here with another video and for today's one, obviously it's 2023, it's a post-pandemic world and a lot of countries are experiencing a whole bunch of different financial crises. Australia is not immune to that and neither am I. So a lot of people around me are asking me, how exactly do you afford a fish room with over 50 tanks? So today I'm gonna give you my best money saving schemes when it comes to keeping fish on a budget. And hopefully you'll be able to keep those tanks through these rough patches so that you can have them and enjoy them a bit more when things stabilize. Okay, so the first one is gonna be insulation. It is a fairly cheap way to get very quick results. Now, if your room is poorly insulated, of course, putting foam insulation up and around the walls or um, bat insulation in the roof, that fiberglass batting, usually it's pink in color and you can pick it up from most hardware stores. But those sorts of things are gonna be quick and easy wins, however, if you just have a tank in a bedroom or something like that, well, you're probably gonna scratch your head and think, how exactly can I better insulate this room? Things like putting it up against a window might be a good idea in a permanent fish room, but if it's a bedroom, you're probably likely to want to keep that window, you know, for your sunlight uh, viewing pleasure or for your, I don't know, staring out of pleasure. So in terms of insulation, you can also insulate the tank. Most people will not want to cover all sides of the tank with foam insulation. However, you can easily and quite decoratively uh, insulate at least three sides with a foam 3D background. Now to do that, you of course have to empty the tank out, clean it all up and silicon in the foam 3D backgrounds but as well as improving the look potentially, it's gonna help to keep some of that heat in. Now glass is a pretty poor insulator. If you've ever put your hand on a glass during a hot or cold day, you'll notice that it fluctuates quite a lot depending on what the outside temperature is doing. And aquariums are no different. If the water you're trying to keep inside is 25 degrees or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and the outside temperature differs from that, whether that is very high or very low, well, the glass isn't gonna to do too much to buffer that out. However, if that water temperature has to go through a layer of foam 3D background to get out, well, at least in half of the directions, meaning the back and two sides, the, that temperature is gonna be held in a lot better. It might still go out the top and front and through the bottom, but most of us should have our tanks seated on a foam mat anyway. Um, yeah, it should help a lot. As well as that, I think it's one of those ones where, you know, being frugal doesn't mean that things have to be ugly. And you can find a few uh, foam 3D backgrounds pretty cheaply on, on websites like eBay, or you can try and make your own and get creative. So um, yeah, foam 3D backgrounds on three sides is a pretty quick win if you've only got a few tanks, but it's easily scaled up if you've got even more than that. Next one, if we're talking about heat escaping through our water, definitely put lids on your aquarium. Does it have to be glass lids? No, you can definitely make some lids out of twin wall or um, also known as greenhouse panel. Uh, you, again, picking that up from your hardware store, it's gonna be super uh, strong, especially if, even if you've got big fish that are likely to smash into it. Putting effective lids on your tanks are gonna do two things. First of all, it's gonna contain that layer of hot air that is just rising up out of the tank naturally. And secondly, it's gonna stop evaporative cooling caused by any breezes or drafts within the house that are sort of going uh, across the top of your water. So yeah, it's, it's gonna make a huge difference. It'll also uh, lower the humidity in the room and the likelihood of mold and things like that. So for a little bit of hassle, or maybe a little bit of reduced aesthetic, I think that having a tight fitting lids can be really, really effective in lowering your heating costs in your fish room or uh, just aquariums in general. The next one, I'm just gonna put in a big pile to make this video a lot of bang for buck in terms of time, and I'm just gonna label it efficiency. A lot of us have, you know, um, outdated lighting fixtures like old fluorescent bulbs and things like that. And I don't think I'm telling any secrets that uh, LED technology has really, really improved the efficiency. So if you want some quick wins on your power bill, update, updating your lights to LEDs can really help. 
Now they also produce a lot less heat than some of those fluorescent bulbs and so forth. So your heater might have to work a little bit more, but overall you're gonna see a gain there in your electricity. As well as that, a lot of us run our lights for way too long and way too high powered. So especially if you're growing low light plants or no plants at all, you really don't need your lights on when you're not there. Your fish will get enough ambient light from a room, so they're not gonna be adversely affected by being in the dark, especially if the decision is getting rid of your fish tank or reducing your photo period to two, three hours a day and reducing your light fixture from 80% strength to 10% strength. Well, I think your fish are gonna appreciate being in a loving home over a little bit of extra light in the day. Smart timers and other light timers can really help to get a consistent photo period in there. And you know, they're really, really cheap and accessible these days. Uh, a lot of my Wi-Fi timers I picked up for $9.99 Australian from Aldi. So you can find them, uh, create a nice schedule in the app that's gonna make sure that your lights are turning on when you're around the fish tank, which is most important. Next one, filtration. How many people have multiple canister filters set up um, you might have a hang on back over here, canister over here, internal filter over here. And consolidating all of those to be purely run off air will really save you quite dramatically off your power bill. In most cases, it will also reduce noise depending on which air pump you choose. Well, it'll probably trade that noise from a bubbling noise, which I find far more pleasant than a sort of hum, humming noise of an impeller spinning around uh, inside a mechanical filter. Sponge filters are really cheap. It allows a lot of room for expansion and you know, creating an air loop is really one of the best things you can do if you are starting to feel the itch of multi-tank syndrome. So why not start right now? Now I understand that you might have some big, heavy waste producing fish that might require a canister filter, but in times of economic difficulty, you know, I've definitely put in like eight, nine, 10 sponge filters in a big tank with Oscars, and they've still survived really, really fine. You know, it might be a little bit more dirty in there. You might have to do a couple more extra water changes, or you might have to, you know, um, occasionally run a hang on back filter just to polish the water a little bit, which is fine and will still save you money rather than running that filter 24 seven. But so long as you have a big enough water volume and another topic we'll talk about later, you're controlling uh, what's going into that tank, then um, sponge filters will really do a, a far better job than you'll probably give it credit for. So swapping over now rather than later can definitely help you in the long run. Now that seems like a good enough segue as ever to go on to my next one, which is controlling feeding habits. A lot of us as well instinctively overfeed our fish. Now we think that we need three square meals a day and portion control is an issue that I, as well as many humans these days struggle with. So it goes without saying that we impart that onto our aquariums more often than not. Your fish will survive on remarkably little food. And if you've ever gone away, you'll know that most people recommend you don't even have to feed your fish for up to 10 days if you go away on holiday and things like that. So why do we need to throw handfuls and handfuls of food in every single day? All we're doing is creating more waste, creating more water changes and costing ourselves at the fish store when we're buying our new extra food. Um, if, you, if you buy a set of measuring spoons, that can help to create portion control, as well as that I've shown before, uh, using uh, pill boxes to create the portions and kind of meal prep for your fish, if you will. But a lot of us could do with reducing our fish feeding in half, especially if we're not trying to really fatten them up for breeding, although a lot of us are trying to do that all the time as well. So um, considering the fish food that you're feeding, I definitely lean towards reducing the food of a quality brand rather than switching a quality food for uh, a cheaper alternative. Because I think that having slightly less of everything that you actually want going into your fish's body rather than more food, but it's all just 90% fillers and so forth, is gonna help um, your fish's health as well as creating less of that sort of um, pollution in the water because that's really what a lot of that attributes to. So um, 
yeah, portion control in your fish room can help to ease the pressure of some of those bills as well. Next one is if you can, harnessing the natural environment. If you can collect your own rainwater, if you have access to uh, other water sources that you're not gonna pay for through the town water or the municipal water source, then that can help because it's essentially provided for free. Uh, if you can harness natural light, which will also limit your photo period of your you know, uh, unnatural light or the light that you're paying for through your electricity bill, these things can help. It's certainly not gonna hurt as long as your fish tank isn't you know, directly in the sun for nine hours a day. And similarly, whilst a lot of us change a lot of water every single week, um, you know, any little bit helps, especially you know, even if you're just putting rainwater into some of your more soft water tanks, epistos and that sort of thing, then you're doing um, tap water, water changes for you know, African cichlids or whatever, depending on what your municipal water source is like then every little bit helps. So you can try and reduce your costs there using the natural environment. And the last one I wanna talk about revolves all around water. So again, it's a bit of a two-parter, but the first one is a lot of us keep our temperatures a lot higher than they actually need to be. A lot of times, a lot of the species of fish, you know, you might be keeping them at sort of 26, 27, which I think is around about 84, 85 Fahrenheit. And those species are gonna live thrive and survive in closer to you know 80 or 78 lower 20s and, and in actual fact by reducing the temperature a couple of degrees your fish are going to eat less anyway with the sl more slowed metabolism they're going to be less aggressive and you know it's not going to do them any damage they probably live longer as well so um, if you're just keeping your fish tank because you love those species rather than trying to create some sort of guppy factory or whatever some mad scientist is trying to achieve, well, lowering the temperature will help you out with temperament, food bills and electricity bills and overall it's just a win-win. The other one as well is a lot of us are doing way too many water changes, especially in planter tanks. You know, dictate your water changes, not just because you've always done it weekly and you've always done a certain percent. Actually test the water. Um, change it once the nitrates get to 20 parts per million or, um, you know, you start to notice some other deficiencies in a mineral that is being absorbed. But, you know, sometimes you might actually find that your water never gets to 20 parts per million. And, you know, especially when you're looking at your feeding habits, uh, the temperature is a bit lower and you've got heaps of plants in there, you might find that you can go months and months and months without any water changes at all. Now, me personally, I like to still do them, uh, especially during rain events to trigger spawning and things like that. And that's totally fine, so long as that is your reason for water changing. But if you're in a... Um, sort of economic crisis or you're trying to tighten the screws then doing water changes for water changes sake is throwing good money after bad. So there you go guys those are my quick tips to cut costs and keep your fish room running especially if you've got you know um, just crazy crazy numbers kind of flying in and out of your bank account like it seems to be at the moment. If you've got any other awesome tips for other viewers be sure to drop them down below and uh, if you did like the video, it always helps me out to smash like, hit subscribe and all that fun stuff. Other than that, enjoy your fish keeping and I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.